Welcome back to Interview Out, where our mission is to help 100,000 people land their dream job. For those of you who are new here, what we do in these videos on Thursdays generally uh, is we review mock interviews, real mock interviews, people like yourself, uh, which are executed by a former senior executive, me, uh, from Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, a handful of startups, to walk through what a real interview should feel like. The mock interviews are real. I pull them from my question data bank, and I go through and press pretty hard to make sure that the candidates are fully prepared for their real job interview. In these videos specifically, what I will then do is walk through and do a chalk talk analysis and basically break down the video and talk to you about what I saw as an interviewer, why I asked questions, what things kind of gave me the mm, or what things were really, really good. Uh, and then at the end of the videos, we'll walk through my assessment that I would have read into the room for the candidate had it been a real loop. By the way, if you are interested in a free mock interview or any other of the software or services that we provide to help you get prepared for your job interview, please check out interviewat.com. This candidate is a program manager targeting a director level role at a big tech company, Fang, or I guess now we're calling it Mang with Meta now being Facebook. The specific leadership principle that I was pushing on with my question was dive deep. And the specific question was asking the candidate to walk me through a problem that they had either individually or with a team where they had to go several layers deep to understand the problem. Specific things to look for when considering a question that's tied to the dive deep leadership principle. Does the candidate, or as you as a candidate, did you display a firm grasp of details? Details matter, specifically in questions related to dive deep. We wanna know as an interviewer, do you understand the problem? Can you unpack it? What's important, what's not? What do you share? Do you overshare? In oversharing, that's you're basically communicating you don't know what's important because this is an interview, you have a limited amount of time, focus on the details and where you have them, use metrics and data to make your point. A second thing to look for throughout this interview is does the candidate provide specific drill down details or do they remain fuzzy and at a high level? Finally, does the candidate or you as a candidate, do you provide meaningful and useful metrics as you walk through your answer? As is always the case with these videos, I will play back the video of the mock interview in its entirety, but I will jump in occasionally with thoughts and comments and we'll finish up with a summary at the end. Yeah, so you can pick one of these that is, it's what I'm, I'm specifically looking for here is you as a leader, not you as part of a, a team, even though you had people below you, but I'm, I'm specifically looking for you as kind of the buck stops here, here guy. Um, I want you to describe a problem where you and your team had to kind of go down a few layers, right? Ask why a few times. Uh, to get at the root problem. First, just, just kind of walk me through the issue and then I'm gonna have a set of follow-on questions to really kind of pressure test the answer. Sure. Um, I'll give you a, a uh, let's go for one for So, uh, oh, actually no, I'll, I'll roll this back one and go for And no, you want one as a Yeah, let's go for country street. Um, so uh, my team, uh, my current team, in fact, owns uh, incident management. So incident is any production outage. Um, and incident management all up is the process of responding to managing SLAs against, managing remediation against, um, and then tracking those remediation tasks actually getting done. The heavy work on incident management tends to actually be the remediation portion because um, up front, you don't really, uh, you don't know the skate come out, right? Um, that's tech that. Uh, it's after it blows up. So you had an incident that resulted in production outage or some data loss. You responded to it. You did the five whys. Now you have some radiation tests. Uh, my team owns the SLAs around all of that. So um, for the better half of 2019, um, and I'd just taken ownership of this problem. So the, the person responsible for this just transferred to my team. Um, those SLAs hadn't moved. Uh, they were hovering at basically 50% of remediation tasks got done. Uh, if you're going to offer up something juicy like 50% of our things weren't getting done, but then continue down the path of kind of explaining the situation, a, a logical question that's going to trigger in my mind as a, just as a leader of a company is why? And so that's that's kind of a you know, potential uncut, you know, unkempt thing that he didn't actually deal with or didn't address that we're gonna to wanna to make sure gets addressed. So we had an incident, some stuff was resolved in a five wise or some other form of post-mortem. Uh, the things we need to do to fix that, make sure the same thing doesn't happen again. 50% um, of those uh, didn't get done ever, or at least hadn't several months later. 
Um, and we kept sending out these emails, we being my, the person on my team that, that was responsible for this, uh, and no one kept caring. So he kept sending out emails that said, hey, you're SL laser crap, hey, you're SL laser crap, hey, you're SL laser crap, um, and nothing happened. And so I went to him and said, uh, he transferred in my team about two months before this at this point. Uh, I said, hey, you know. Just a quick kind of note here. One of the pieces of comments that I send out in my follow-up sessions to customers at interview.com is that, you know, you got to realize you're in an interview. Even though there's a camera in front of you and the person's not sitting in front of you, you're in an interview. And you got to be mindful of some of your verbal tics and even your visual kind of movement tics. And what you may not have noticed was the candidate was kind of doing this a lot with their head. It's extremely distracting when you're doing an interview. It's just something to keep in mind. I've had candidates spinning in their chairs and other things, but it's just, you're in an interview. Pretend like you're staring at the camera and the person is on the other side of the camera and, and you're not just kind of looking around the room. These instant management numbers don't seem to be moving. Have they ever? And he said, well, we changed the way we tracked them three months ago and you know, there's some things there. And I went, okay, why did we change the way we tracked them? Well, because they were spread all over the, the, the knowledge base. Okay, um, do you think it's on track? Do you think we can get this to heal? Uh, yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, cool. Um, came back a week later. Hey, what's our progress on this? Um, hasn't actually moved. Okay, new person on my team. We haven't really you know, moved together yet. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more gentle than I might otherwise be. Hey, uh, why isn't this moving? Well, because they don't think it's important. Okay. Why don't they think it's important? Have you talked to the basically heads of each division in engineering and uh, understood, you know, have you talked to them and sat down and been like, hey guys, you need to care about this? Yeah, um, what happened? Well, some of them did. Okay, did their numbers go up? Yes. How much? Temporarily, I see. Okay. Um, how many of these processes are you running for them? And he and I went through that a little bit one-on-one. -on -one, and then he and I went through that with one of the engineering leaders um, too, in fact, and we found out that, uh, you know, dissecting the five wise, your first problem was they didn't actually care. Um, they were willing to have Grant nag them about it. And if he nagged them about it sufficiently, they occasionally got to it, but really nothing else happened. Um, Grant's the name of the, the person in question. Second, um, for that matter, very few people even knew that half of them never got remediated. And third, there was no one place they could actually see tracking against this. But the underlying business problem is that if you actually do some rough sizing, right? Okay, let's presume unremediated incidents are likely to recur and we know business value of the incidents that have occurred and you can assess probability by how much of it's done, right? Okay, remediated half of it, let's discount half the cost. Um, we found that we had about five to $6 million of unremediated risk hanging out in that backlog because if you take all the incidents that have and you look at the unremediated ones and you say, well, those are likely to recur. Let's even discount them at 50%. Let's say it's two to three, um, but you have two to $3 million of assessable risk. Um, and the root cause there is, is, is twofold. First, um, nobody had really explained that in neat terms to anyone. And second, nobody had really assessed that in any terms. So uh, the person in question, Grant, was engaged in some perfectionism exercises um, well, I can't cost those incidents. Why can't you? Because most of them haven't been estimated. Well, have over 20% of them been estimated? Yes. Have over 20% of them been estimated accurately? Well, reasonably to within 20%. Okay. And so you get the general picture here of it was a problem of understanding the underlying business problem and then communicating it. Um, and, you know, there's, there's SLAs and trappings around that, but that's kind of the, the nutshell and I'll pause there. There. So if you're going to tell a story what this candidate did correct was he identified that they had used a clear framework for how they were going to get at a problem right the, the question was walk me through a multi-level analysis and the candidate correctly presented hey we use the five whys analysis if you don't know what the five whys is go look it up uh, i think there's a pretty good page on uh, on uh, wikipedia but you know plenty of youtube or, or google type content you can go find but he then proceeds to tell the story as to how they worked through it as a, in his head, he's, it's clear to him, not to me, the interviewer, right? Because he's doing a back and forth conversation between two people, I think. One of them, I believe, is him. And it's, it, it's a very hard format to communicate effectively to someone who doesn't know any of the parties involved. Now, he and I meeting for the first time, and this is true if you're in an interview. 
you're meeting with that person likely for the first time. They don't know you except for as a piece of paper or as a LinkedIn profile, whatever, but they don't know you. And so if you're going to engage in this kind of back and forth conversational retelling of a, of a situation, it's very easy for me, the interviewer, to get lost. And so what I lost in all of this is did he actually answer the question? Right? He kind of talked about, well, there's unmitigated risk and there's some things that weren't getting dealt with. But I, I don't, other than just asking why five times, which is, is a fine framework, I'm not, it's not clear to me what he did as a candidate to effectively kind of go down several layers and challenge his team. And so that, that got lost in the way he decided to communicate this story. Well, so I guess it, it was really hard to follow the back and forth of that, that conversation style as you presented it. So, so who was this that you were talking with? It sounds like it was someone who wasn't on your team, but is now on your team. I think I got that much, mm -hmm. but wh what was the, the, the core misunderstanding? And I think I'm going to play back what I just heard from you, which was that they didn't appreciate the issue as it related to the impact it was having on the business. Did I hear that correctly? Well, and it, it was a little bit more. I actually did him two favors here. Uh, one, I made it clear that he didn't answer the question. And that's, that's me as the interviewer being kind and saying, hey, you need to do a better job. Not all interviewers will do that. Uh, I tend to do that in the mock interviews so that I can make the point later, hey, you need to be listening uh, for when an, an interviewer is telling you or giving you data that you're not sufficiently answering the question. The second thing I did was I repeated back what I thought I heard, right? And this has come up uh, in a few follow-ups uh, in the last couple of weeks has put it front of my mind, which is you have to remember, if I repeat something back to you and I'm wrong, it's because that's what I, the interviewer, internalized from what you gave to me as the candidate. You have to remember, it is your job to clearly communicate with the interviewer what you want them to remember. If they're not taking notes and they walk out of that room and you weren't a clear communicator, good luck having your stuff accurately reflected when they're in the room discussing whether or not you're a candidate that they want to pound the table for and support, or they just go, you know, I don't, I don't really remember much about this candidate, but we can move on, right? So it's up to you to communicate effectively and my ability as the interviewer, or any, any interviewer, to process what you're saying and remember it or write it down or whatever it is, is 100% on you, the candidate, effectively communicating and not overburdening me from doing my job, which is in the room, interpreting what you're saying and trying to make sense of it. When you make it harder for me, it's actually down the road going to be a disservice for you. That. They understood and were very frustrated that no one else believed it was that important. Um, but they hadn't done the legwork to communicate it, and they hadn't done, and they they had analysis paralysis a bit about, well, I can't get accurate costs, therefore I can't get any costs. Rather than saying something like, well, if I have 20% of incidents costs, I can kind of project that across the rest of them at the same severity class or something like that, as a mechanism for estimating this. This person came from a developer background, and so they kind of expected a level of accuracy you don't get in program management. Um, and they were, they were effectively, the issue ultimately is they didn't communicate value. Um, but the proximal causes of that issue were they didn't understand how to do some rough estimations against that value rather than actually try to like literally go through every incident ever and hand estimate the impact of all of them, of all like N hundred, you know, with thousands of remediation steps. Okay. And so with that, I, I... I guess I missed the solve step, right? How did you ultimately use this, this back and forth to get to a solve step? That, that's me, the interviewer, asking the question again, right? Not all interviewers will do this. They might just be happy to move on and say, oh, just didn't answer the question. But, you know, as we do these mock interviews, it's to highlight where things are going right and where things are going wrong. And this is now kind of the third time in the questions that I've had to basically ask the same question, right? Walk me through multi-level analysis, how you solved it, et cetera. And so... When you're answering your questions from the interviewer, you, you need to be cognizant of, did you actually answer the question that they asked? That's basic step one, right? Basic step one, you gotta get that done. Otherwise, uh, it's gonna be problematic for you to move through the rest of the interview because you're gonna lose the interviewer. As a candidate, you're gonna lose them. And then you know once they flip the bid on you, they've got other things to do, they're, they're, they're busy, right? So they're not gonna continue to invest in the interview. Yeah, so when we'd rooted it out, um... He and I sat down and uh, pulled the data to say, well, okay, let's build some estimators. Let's take the incidents we have the value of and project over the incidents we don't understand 
use that to assess the backlog and say, you know, we have a lowball estimate of two million and a highball estimate of four to six of unremediated risk. Then uh, let's reach out to the head of engineering and communicate that to say, hi, you need to care about incident management. Here's why it's four to six million dollars, two to three on the low end. Um, to do this, you need each of your directors. So head of engineering is functionally the CTO, directors are functionally the VPs in this model. You need each of your directors to engage on this um, and set up healthy processes within their teams. Grant and I will happily go around to each of them and kick those, but then they have to self-sustain. Ultimately, when we talk about delivering answers in an interview, we want to make sure that we're effectively communicating all of the pieces of required information. And you know, on this channel, what I use over and over again is the star format because it's easy to understand and it enforces linear storytelling, right? Kind of makes you go through the progression of the story. The R here is really important. What are the results? I, I still, in, in answering this question, which is, hey, give me a multi-level analysis where you had to solve a problem, right? Solve a problem invites, hey, tell me what you did and what the results were, and we're still not there, right? So the candidate has kind of shared a lot, and it's a, kind of a mixed bag as far as delivery, but no results have actually been shared. And that's just something as a, as, as a candidate, you have to keep in mind, because if you fail, to offer that up as part of your answer. The completeness of your answer is lower. And if you have a lazy interviewer, they might not ask you the follow-up question. And that's a risk that you shouldn't take. That's an unforced error. Uh, and so how successful were you in solving this across your organization? Quite. Um, so that was... And, and I guess also in what time, sorry, and in what time frame? It, uh, so that was about a year ago now. Um, the SLAs at the time were in the 50s, basically. Uh, meaning it was coin flip whether they got remediated or not ultimately they're hanging out now at about 85 to 90 each um after a so within three weeks uh of that hey let me explain to you the the risk they popped up to about 70 75 um within four weeks which is about the time it took us to round robin through most of them we'd brought them up to about 80 85 and we've been steadily trending toward about 90 cents so right now basically one in ten doesn't get remediated as opposed to one in two so overall, I would say that this candidate struggled a little bit with their delivery because they, they pretended, no, pretended is the wrong word. They utilized a, a too conversational in approach um, in how they were dealing with me, the interviewer, but also in how they were recalling stuff that happened in the past. The risk in doing that is because I, as the interviewer, don't know you or anybody else involved in the story, and it's not clear in my head because as this I guarantee you, as this candidate was telling the story, they're basically doing a video replay in their head and they can see this person that they're talking about and the various people involved in the story. I have no idea who any of these people are. And so I can't track as the interviewer easily what is actually happening if this is the kind of back and forth. A more effective way to have solved this would have been to talk about the parties involved. Say, we utilize a five wise analysis and the, the questions that I asked were one, two, three, four, five. The challenges which were presented to me by, by the person who worked for me were X, but we knew that we had some additional difficulties with another group that we were working with, and you know that person was someone we had to deal with, and this, these are the steps we took to resolve that. That's still presenting all of the information, demonstrating he has a framework for handling problems with multi-level analysis, the five whys, that's great. Walking me through what the issues were, why they mattered, then he can share who was involved and what kind of the roadblocks were. And then ultimately we have to deliver on what were the results, right? Kind of get into the what happened and what were the results. Now, once asked, he gave great feedback as to what the results were. They were specific. They had numbers. It was massive improvement. And he had a timeline, which is all really, really good. So from a communication standpoint, kind of a mixed bag. But from an overall content standpoint, kind of demonstrating level of appropriateness, I would say pretty good, but some challenges, right? When you're kind of going for those more senior level roles, it can be a bit tricky. Now, the assessment I would have read into the room for this candidate on Dive Deep is as follows. The candidate presented an answer which gives some level of concern for ability to operate at L7 for ability to dive deep. Uh, L7 is just a categorization of level for the kind of role he was targeting. This might be an instance of story selection, but the answer ultimately failed to deliver on a multi-level, multivariate analysis. Unclear is whether this is tied to the lack of relevant experience, lack of understanding of the question, or poor execution. Regardless, the lack of depth of clarity, depth and clarity for a broader and more multifaceted discussion gives rise to concern about the ability to dive deep. Other answer blocks also lacked this depth of field, preferring instead to stay high level. So it sounds like on this rewatching, I was a little bit nicer than I was when I first uh, had this candidate come through. And, and upon reflection and reading that, I, I think there is you know a miss here on my part here doing this video, which is, yeah, no, I mean, look, the reality is, uh, it was a bit high level and 
if I'm thinking about the kind of role that this person is going for, it is a more senior role. It is, you know, you've got responsibility for at least tens of, if not $100 million revenue, right, in big tech, uh, or you know, a team with a large number of parties involved. And you're managing multi-team uh, resources. In this case, the person was a manager of managers. And so the level of detail, and maybe it was I was set off by the casualness at the time, and I've, I've kind of softened on that, but his casual nature and how he walked through his answer isn't the best look. Uh, when you're going for your marketing. And we, we had that conversation. We talked through, uh, and I remember this candidate, we talked through a lot of the, the, the assessment. Uh, and ultimately, you know, he did fix quite a bit of this, or at least he took it to heart as far as how he was presenting and ultimately landed uh, the job he was trying to get. So I guess, you know, net plus there, uh, but sometimes you need the hard feedback um, to, to get the big gains.